is preaching time in this sanctuary. <laughs> Glory to God. Go to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 15, verse 21 through 28. I'll be reading out of the NIV this morning. And I believe I have a word from the Lord. The Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 15, beginning at verse 21 and concluding at verse 28, when you have it, say amen. amen. You watching online, I want you to get your Bible too. Don't just watch us read out the Bible. Get your Bible too, or read the Bible as it is, as it appears on the screen. I want you to listen at every word of this text as if it were vitally important starting with the first verse which is generally skimmed over it is important leaving that place jesus withdrew to the region of tyre and sidon a canaanite woman from that from that vicinity came to him crying out lord son of david have mercy on me my daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly Jesus didn't say nothing. He did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. Woman ain't said nothing about them. Ain't that funny how people like to be important because they're around somebody important? Send her away because she crying after us. She ain't said nothing about no disciple. Peter, James, John, Luke, Mark, or nobody. She said, Jesus, thou son of David. Now they talking about she crying after us. He answered, watch this. I was, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. She said, yes, it is, Lord. She said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. In the King James Version, he says, I have not found so great a faith in all of Israel. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Can you say amen? amen. Father, sanctify the word in our hearts. I thank you for the privilege of having this opportunity to assemble not only with the believers in this room, but believers around the world and around the country in different time zones and circumstances in different socioeconomic levels of life, different genders, different ideas, different backgrounds, different circumstances. We have all come to tabernacle under the cloud of your glory. Speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. Open up our ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. I thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody shout amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> many, many times when you see this text, it's, it's Mother's Day. <laughs> and we tend to take texts about women and apply them to women. But if we only see this woman from her gender alone, I think we miss some significant points for our consideration. But before I get too deep into this, I want to share a story with you. So about three or four weeks ago, uh, I had met a gentleman. We had corresponded by email a few times. Uh, he was from another country. He said, I'm going to be in the U.S. on such and such a date. I want to meet you. I admire your work. I stream your broadcast. He may be streaming this morning. I'm not going to call you his name, but he knows who he is if he's streaming. He said, I stream your broadcast all the time. He knew my messages better than I did. I mean, he knew them word by word, verse by verse, quote by quote, even knew what I had on when I was preaching and all that kind of stuff. And I was amazed. And I was amazed in part because he was not a Christian. 
he was not a Christian. He was not a sinner either. He just was, he belonged to another uh, faith, another faith tradition altogether. And I was amazed that somebody from a completely different faith tradition would pay that much attention to what I was preaching and to consume it and to value it in the way that he did. So I agreed to meet with him. And I met with him because he is building uh, inc incub work incubators all around the country for job creation in underserved communities and he's doing it very well. And I was excited about it, how he has this global impact on the world by building these business incubators that are largely STEM programs that enable people to start businesses from these incubators. And he had one uh, in our area and I went to see it and I toured the facility. Then I was impressed by it and I was inspired by it and I was moved by it. I got to meet his board. I got to address them for a few moments and talk to them and to think that he was doing what I would be happy to do in a few places. He's literally doing it all over the world. I Googled him and done my homework and he was a world renowned individual who has more degrees than a thermometer and all these accomplishments and all these great things that he had, had done. And I enjoyed talking with him. I connected with being a person of vision. We were both people of vision and people of passion. And and people who went after what we saw and believed God to help the community and change the world around us and leave something behind in terms of legacy that really mattered. But he was another religion. And that was fine, that was fine. I work with all types of people. You can't be a broad person and only work with church people. Yeah. Uh, I grew up in a small church in a small town with small ideas. And, the, and when small eyes read scriptures, they pull out small things. And so they would teach us small ideas. Come out from among them and be ye separated, saith the Lord, and I shall be your God and ye shall be my people. And they may come out from among them, come out from them worldly people. Well, I, I did come out, but I went to school with them and I had to work with them and I had to interact with them and they lived across the street from me. And, and I understand what the Bible means when it says come out from among them. It means have your own identity, not to, you can associate without assimilating with with those types of people. But in a broader sense, God says all souls are mine. All souls are mine. And understanding that all souls belongs to God, that God cares about all people. I was just wrestling between my own traditions and my own philosophy. And the reason I was wrestling is because we got to the end of the tour. His executive staff is all standing out there. His CFO, his COO, his COE, his CEE, his CAA, his CKY, and all of them that standing out out there on the sidewalk and they've come to say goodbye to me. And of all times in the world, the anointing came on me. And I said, this is, this is not a good time, Jesus. This, this, this is not a good time, Jesus. This is not the part of that. This is not a good time. The anointing of God came upon me and worse still, God gave me a word of knowledge. I said, I don't want to give him no word of knowledge, Lord. He already has plainly told me that he is of a different religion and what I look like giving him a word of knowledge. And the Lord said, do what I said. And I gave this guy the word of knowledge and the next thing I knew, I had laid hands on him on the sidewalk, on the sidewalk, in front of his board, in front of his staff, and Hattie has taught me better than to do that. I know I'm not supposed to be like speaking in tongues in a board meeting, but there I am talking to this very important person and I had grabbed him with both hands by the head, forgot about COVID and everything. Just, just. I laid hands on him and gave him this word of knowledge and it wasn't necessarily about salvation, it was a word of knowledge for him and tears leaped out of his eyes. He leaped out of his eyes and he turned, he looked at me and he turned and he walked away and he went walking down the sidewalk and he was crying. And, and I drove home confused because all of my different religious ideas was arguing with each other. One of us said, that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> 
he's he, he not one of us. He's, he's not one of us. And you gave him a word and it affected him like that. And, and, and the way you felt about it, it, it goes against your background, your tradition, all this. And, and sometimes your tradition gets in the way of a revelation. And in that moment, we, we both talked about it later that we learned something about God. That, that God has a way of transcending what we have been taught and what our background was and what country we come from and what language we speak, that God will break all of those rules to accomplish what he's trying to accomplish in your life. Now, now if we only see this text through the lens of a desperate mother seeking help for her daughter, though that is what she is, if that's all we see about the text, we will do an injustice to the text. It's obvious that though she wasn't a follower of Jesus, she had been an, an observer of him, like my friend was. She knew who he was. Jesus, our son of David, is not, that's a messianic greeting that normally a Jew would give to the Messiah. She is not Jewish at all, and yet she is familiar enough with the lingo that she speaks Jesus' language. She had been an observer of him. She knew exactly who he was. She was desperate enough, desperate enough to cross the line of her tradition desperate enough to cross the line of her tradition. And you know something, God can't do anything with you until you get desperate. As long as you say, I'm not going over to that interdenominational church because I'm Baptist, or I'm not going over to that interdenominational church because I was raised Catholic. I'm not going because I'm white. I'm not going because I'm black. I'm not going because I'm Asian. I'm not going because I'm Indian. Let me tell you something, when you get in enough trouble, You will go anywhere to get anything from anybody that will help you to get through. It's like dialing 911. I don't call 911 and say, please send a black paramedic. No, send a paramedic that can help me right now. I don't care if I can't pronounce their name. I want them to be able to help me right now. I don't ask them when they pull up, are you a Christian? I ask if you got some oxygen. I need some help right now. You have to understand that desperate situations require a desperate response. And this morning, I want to talk to you about desperate faith. I want to talk to you about desperate faith. Desperate faith. Not passive, religious, superficial, traditional, self-righteous, pharisaical faith. I want to talk to you about desperate faith, the kind of faith that will cross lines, break rules, make you reach out, cross generations, break down barriers. Whatever you got to do to get a breakthrough, you have to have, have that level of desperate faith. Now you have to be radical, and you may even have had to live a while to know what desperate faith is. Because sometimes, if you haven't lived a while, you haven't been desperate. See, when my kids were little, they weren't desperate. Because they were disciples. They had everything they needed. I, it was our job to make sure that they weren't desperate. Maybe when they grew up and got out on their own, they got a little desperate because you, those bills start coming in your name and a house payment comes in your name and all of a sudden you get a revelation that milk doesn't just appear in the refrigerator by magic and so you stop leaving it out on the counter for three days. C come on, talk to me somebody. Let's be real. Are there any desperate people listening at me today? You've gone through some things, you understand some things, you've endured some things, and you need God to help you get through some things, and you're going through some critical things right now. You didn't come to church this Sunday because you got a cute dress. 
You didn't come to church this Sunday because you got a new suit and you want to show it off. You didn't come to church this morning just to see what's going on. You're not logged on to this broadcast broadcast because you don't need to wash your clothes and you don't have nothing else to do and the kids ain't pulling at you. But you're desperate enough to be engaged in God in a, in a way that's different from other people. Some of your other family members may be playing in the house. Some of them may have went out to play golf. Some of them might be shooting hoops. Somebody might be doing something else. But as for you, you're stuck in front of this screen because you are looking for a word from God. You're looking for a word from God. Somebody shout desperate faith. Desperate faith is, isn't passively blaming God for our own choices and mistakes. A lot of times we blame God for things that we did to ourselves. I've been believing God for three years to get out of debt and he hadn't come through for me yet. He didn't get you in debt. Let's first assume responsibility that your behavior brought you to the place that you're in and stop blaming God like God fail you uh, for not being codependent in your cycle of dysfunction. Because sometimes we use faith because we want God to enable us to remain dysfunctional. And he doesn't answer us a word because until you fix your habits, he's not going to pour more resources into a dysfunctional system. I, I know I lost a few people on that. <laughs> But I'm just sick and tired of people saying, I tithed and it didn't work. I gave a couple of Sundays, I threw a $20 bill on the altar and I was expecting my million dollar breakthrough. Why would God give you a million dollars when you ran through a thousand dollars? God wants you to be faithful over a few things before he makes you ruler over many. I know I wouldn't get much shouting today, but that's okay. <coughs> Desperate faith isn't sitting idly by in despair waiting for a divine miracle to replace human effort. I'm believing God for a job with my remote control in the hand. I'm believing God. I prayed three times for a job and the Lord ain't answered me. I don't understand what's wrong. God ain't gonna never answer you because faith without works is dead, being alone. You got to get out there and get your hustle on, sister girl. You got to get your hustle on. You got to get out there and make it happen. You got to make it do what it do. And if don't nobody hire you, you got to make t-shirts, candied apples, hot dogs, I don't care what you got to do, rib dinners, you got to be about your father's business. And then ask God to bless the works of your hands. The Bible said, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And if you're not doing anything, you're not giving God anything to prosper. No, he's not coming in your living room. Boaz is never going to ring the doorbell while you sitting in the house in your house coat and your hair in rolling. My Boaz is coming. You better hope he don't. If he come, he going to leave. He going to get up out of there as quickly as he can because you're not ready for Boaz. You ain't Ruth, don't expect Boaz. <laughs> Desperate faith is not us manipulating God to serve our agenda. I want you to help me do this. I want you to help me do this. I want you to help me do this. It's not about getting God to serve your agenda. It's about getting you to serve God's agenda. When you get on God's agenda, you'll already be blessed. Instead of creating something separate over here and asking God to bless something that he didn't create, what you really want God to do is find out what he's doing, do what God is doing, because the blessing is already on the purpose of God. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Desperate faith is not rejecting God's decision because of personal pain. 
to, to, to say, I got desperate faith. I'm just believing God that, that mama's going to live. I'm believing God that she's going to I understand that. I've been there. I understand that. But God is still God. And you have to pray a kind of prayer that says, Lord, I want my mother to live as long as she possibly can. But if you decide that you're going to take her, I have to trust you. I have to trust you. It hurts, but I trust you. I don't understand it, but I trust you. I'm in pain, but I trust you. You know what's best for me. Just give me the strength to stand what hurts in my life. I told the Lord, I told you this last Sunday, I told the Lord, I said, listen, I want my mother to keep on living, but if you give me 90, I'm going to ask for 100. And if you give me 100, I'm going to ask for 110. And if you ask me for 110, I say, how about 112? I'm going to be like 112, 112, 112, going once, going twice, going twice, going twice. Well, can I hear 115? Can I get 115? Can I get 115? 115? Anybody got 115? 150, 120, 120, I'm going for 120, 120, 120 over there, God, I believe it, but 120. Because I'm greedy. I got a greedy love. When I love you, I love you. I really love you. I, sometimes I wish I wouldn't like it. When I love you, I love you like crazy. And I want you to stay forever and ever and ever and ever. And I had to learn that keeping people when they're in pain and when they're suffering and when they're hurting is not a matter of great faith. It's great cruelty. <laughs> it took me a while to finally say, I would rather be in pain and her be in peace. You, you have to grow a while to get to that than for her to be in pain so I can be in peace. It takes a while to grow to that. And I just want to tell you what desperate faith is not. Because a lot of people come to church because they really think that faith is like witchcraft that you can make it do what it do. You can make it do whatever you want it to do. You can just kind of believe God's until you believe somebody else's husband away from them. I believe in God. I know he married, but I believe in God. He not supposed to be married to her. He not happy. I believe in God. They got God. They say God real big God. G-A-W-D, God. God, I believe in God. I don't care how much you believe God for my wife, you can't have her. Yeah, that's, that's a lying spirit from the pits of hell. That's a demon spirit, and we got to cast that out because she's already taken. So ain't no need in you believe in God for no Serena and Jake's. <laughs> Believe God for your wife. <laughs> Go out there and do the hard work, get your own wife, leave mine alone. The thing that made this woman desperate is that she had a devil to fight. Is there anybody in here that has a devil to fight? I mean a nasty, old, relentless, vicious, wicked, tenacious devil to fight. You got a devil to fight. And you can't afford to have no cute religion. You got a devil to fight. You can't afford to be steeped in tradition. You got a devil to fight. And whatever it takes to beat that devil out of your house, out of your life, out of your body, out of your mind, out of your emotions, out of your family, out of your children, out of your circumstances, you got a devil to fight. That's why you come to church when you're dressed up, you come to church when you're dressed down, you come to church when your nails are done, you come to church when your nails are broken off, because you a desperate woman, you a desperate man, you got a desperate fight. If they don't tell you to praise the Lord, you gonna pray Praise the Lord anyway, because you're desperate. If they don't tell you to clap your hands, you're going to clap your hands anyway, because you're desperate. Ain't no need to sit beside somebody that's not desperate, because they ain't going to like you. You're going to get on their nerves. You keep jumping up. You keep making noise. You keep crying out. You keep seeking the master. You keep calling on his name. 
because you're desperate. I want some desperate people. I want some desperate people. Type it on the line. Let hell know I'm desperate. I'm desperate. I'll use unusual tactics. I'll fight across the line. I'll do stuff you didn't expect me to do because I'm desperate. I'm getting too old to be playing games. I'm desperate now. I'll fight you now. I'll roll around in the floor. I'll do something bad to you now because I'm desperate. I want some desperate believers in this house to make some noise. Look at somebody tell them I'm desperate now, I'm desperate. You might want to sit by somebody else because I'm desperate. I'm desperate. I may fall out in the floor. I may be slain in the spirit. I may start talking in tongues. I may run up to the altar and fall flat out on my face. I'm desperate. I got a devil to fight. He's after my daughter. He's after my son. He's after my granddaughter. He's after my finances. He's after my children. I got a devil to fight. This means war, devil. I'm rolling up my sleeves. I'm desperate. And whatever I got to do to get a breakthrough, I'm going to get a breakthrough. I'll mess up my hair. I'll cry up my makeup. I'll shake down my curls. I'll sweat out my clothes. I'm desperate for a breakthrough from the Lord. I need about 20 seconds of a sound, of a sound, of a sound, of a of a desperate praise. So, sit down, sit down, sit down. So this woman, <laughs> this woman, she was not a Jew. She was not a Jew. She was not even a Christian. She was a desperate mother who had run out of options. None of her idols or her pagan deities had, had relieved the suffering of her daughter. If they had, she wouldn't have come. The day-to-day -day suffering of her daughter, she obviously loved, had brought her to a place of breaking past her traditions and seeking deliverance from Jesus, a God she had never met. She'd heard about him. It had been noise abroad. There had been some history between her ancestors and Jehovah God. But they had never really fully embraced Jehovah. Not then, not now, and not in the days of Jesus Christ. Before we get too wrapped up in the peril that this woman besought and what she went through and what happened in her life, let's take a look at the historical context of the region itself. It's no accident that the text starts off that Jesus was in the region of Tyre and Sidon. It's no accident. It is the modern day Lebanon. Tyre and Sidon are ancient cities that were originally Phoenician. They're mentioned several times, both in the Old and the New Testament. Over and over again, they have a history with God. Jesus mentions Tyre and Sidon in Luke 10 in the context of judgment. He was pronouncing against cities of Chorazin and Bethsaida. He said they would rise up and condemn you, that, that Tyre and Sidon would have repented had the right miracles been done in their city, and they would rise up against you because I gave you so much more and I got so much less. Tyre and Sidon are port cities. Still existing to this day, one of them, a primary city, the modern Lebanon on the Mediterranean coast. Sidon is believed to have existed prior to 2000 BC. They've been around a long time. 
with power being just a little bit younger, the Old Testament mentions Israel's dealing with these cities, including the Israelites' failure to conquer Sidon and the conquest of the promised land, them Phoenicians could fight. They were known for their ability to fight on the water. They were warriors and they were wealthy and they were a port city. And in all of Joshua's might, he could not whip those Phoenicians. Those Phoenicians were bad. They could throw down. They would go to war. They couldn't conquer Sinan in the conquest of the promised land in Judges 131. Their worship of Sidonian gods on several occasions is mentioned in Judges and other places. And they're obtaining materials from Sidon and Tyre for the building of the temple. They donated the materials that built the temple in Jerusalem but would not worship there. King Hiram of Tyre is a prominent figure in the Bible, provided many of the temple furnishings for Solomon. Tyranians and Sidonians are also mentioned in helping rebuild the temple in Ezra time. <coughs> so they had a close association, but they had their own identity and their own deities and their own libations and their own ceremonies and their own rituals. Queen Jezebel was a Sidonian. Yeah, she was a Sidonian. And when she summonsed all of her uh, prophets to come, they were from Sidon that they came to take up their residence over there. So that gives you a feeling of the temperament of what's going on in, with this woman in, in, in Sidon. The Sidonian city of Zarephath was where a widow took care of Elijah and the Lord provided oil and flour for her through the famine. Remember how Elijah ministered to the widow of Zarephath but never converted her? It is important to understand that God cares about people who don't always care about him. That, 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 that God helps people who don't always help him. That God does not give you a theological test before he gives you a blessing. And yet we live in a world that if you are even seen with somebody of a different faith or a different theology or a different idea, you get all kinds of, crit at least I do, get all kinds of criticism as if we should be segregated off to ourselves, only talk to, walk with, interact with, interview, do anything with anybody who has different ideas. And my question always becomes, how can you convert people you don't talk to? How can you win people you're not nice to? You mean to tell me that we can have a flood like Ida or Katrina and I'm supposed to knock on the door and say, are you saved? And if you saved, I'll save you. And if you're not saved, shame on you. Do you mean to tell me that we're supposed to feed people in the street and only feed people that we agree with and interview them and interrogate them before we feed them? When God feeds everybody, God loves everybody, God helps everybody, everybody. God has mercy on everybody. God heals everybody. God opens doors for everybody. Later, the widow's son became ill and died, and Elijah came and raised him from the dead. God does not just reserve miracles for people who meet a certain criteria. You will remember that the woman who prepared Jesus' body for burial, they called her a sinner and said if he knew who she was, he would not let her anoint his feet with oil. Do you really think that Jesus didn't know who and what that woman was and yet he suffered it to be so because that woman honored him and treasured him even though she did not fully embrace his ideas and had not yet been converted? Oh, I'm going to mess with your theology today. 
The Old Testament has also several prophecies against Tyre and Sidon that predicted a complete overthrow. In Isaiah 23, Jeremiah 25, if you're writing them down, Jeremiah 25 and 27, Ezekiel 28 through 26 through 28, Joel, Amos, Zacharias, on and on and on. There are all kinds of, and they were overthrown over and over again. They were taken into captivity over and over again. Nebuchadnezzar besieged Tyre from 585 to 572 BC. They were overtaken over and over again. Later, later after Jesus' time comes along, Alexander the Great, or before rather, Alexander the Great besieged Tyre in 322 BC. So they had been free and bound and free and bound and back and forth. But no matter what state they were in, they held on to their idolatry. Alexander the Great almost completely destroyed the city, left it in shambles and pieces. The Persian kings, Artaxerxes, conquered Saddam. In short, God prophesied judgment came to pass. Later, both cities became prosperous provinces of Rome. It was while they were provinces of Rome that Jesus comes to Tyre and Saddam. But it's important that you understand the historicity of what was going on at the time because they had had a casual relationship with God but not had been converted by the casual. It is while they were up under Roman colonization that Jesus moves freely into an area where Israel and his theology is not the preeminent influence of the people. The woman is one of the last persons you would expect to see fighting through his minions and his disciples to get an audience with Israel's Messiah. She is the last person. She is the last person. And when she asked Jesus and referred to him as the son of David and asked him to, that her daughter was grievously vexed with the devil, there was a reason for, her, for his silence. He was quiet because he didn't come to her. He wasn't seeking her. He wasn't after her and he knew that she was an idolatress and yet she was desperate. She was desperate. And so Jesus heard her when she came to him, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil, but he answered her not a word. Because sometimes our request contradicts our behavior. Oh, y'all ain't gonna talk to me. Sometimes we want God to do stuff for us that we don't do for him. And we want God to open doors for us and we have not surrendered to him. And we want God to bless us out of our predicament, but we have a sometimey on again, off again relationship with God. And it's just like some of your friends that only call you when they want something. I got some folks that only call me when they want something. And I look down at the call I did and I think, oh Lord, Lord, here we go again. I don't hear about I don't hear from them on a birthday, a Christmas, a holiday, a Father's Day. I don't hear from them on the 4th of July, Labor Day, Memorial Day, any other day. They don't ask me, am I okay? Am I breathing? Am I alive? Have I survived? Can I make it? Am I starving to death? Did the ice age get me? Did the flood get me? Have I, am I floating around in my living room? But the moment they want something, they get on the phone and say, hey man, how you doing? I've been having you on my mind. That's a lie. You ain't thought about me since the last trouble you was in last time. 
and you use me like I'm a bellhop, like I'm a waiter. You use me when you need me and you throw me in the back of your car like I'm a spare tire until the next trip goes along because we don't value relationships. We don't value relationships. We don't give reciprocity to relationships. We only want people when we want them and we want them, we want them to stop everything they're doing and turn around and see about us. But your emergency does not constitute my emergency. And I might be doing something and I might not be able to be there and there's no need in you pinning, sticking pins in a witch doll just because I didn't answer the phone because sometimes I'm busy. Y'all didn't shout me down, but I know I'm telling the truth. What would make this woman from Tyre and Sidon, Jesus is in the region and she goes out searching for Jesus. What would make her do it? I want to tell you what made her do it. The devil made her do it. You know why? Because when the devil gets on your trail tough enough, it will make you call on the name of the Lord. You might be in prison. You might be in the hospital. You might have a needle in your arm. You may have tracks in your legs. You might be shooting up in your toenails. You might be shooting up in your eyelids. You might be shooting up under your fingernail. But when the devil gets through with you, he will make you call on the name of the Lord. He will make you reach out and call on him. He will make you drop down on your knees and say yes to God. Everybody in the church ain't in the church just because they wanted to be in the church. They're not in the church because they never smoked dope. They're not in the church because they never got a high. They ain't in the church because they ain't been in no strip club. They ain't in the church because they ain't been in the street. They ain't been in the church because they haven't whored around. They ain't in the church because they ain't never messed around with a boy. They ain't in the church because they ain't been bisexual. They ain't in the church because they ain't been gay. They ain't in the church. Oh, y'all ain't gonna bother me. Y'all ain't gonna bother me, church folk. Y'all ain't gonna bother me with your phoniness. Y'all not gonna bother me today. They ain't in the church because they ain't had rendezvous in the middle of the night, booty calls at one o'clock in the morning, done all kinds of crazy mess. They're in the church because when the devil got through whooping their behind, they had to come out of them streets. They had to come out of them alleys. They had to come out of them corners. When suicide got through chasing them, when afflictions got through chasing them, when sickness got through chasing them, it brought them down to their knees. I wish I had some real people. I'm sick of phony folks. I'm sick of phony church folk. I'm sick of phony church folk. You ain't never had a fair. You ain't never slept around. You ain't never messed with nobody. You ain't never done nothing. The devil is a lie. You done done all kind of mess. If your life came on screen right now, you'd put your finger up and tip out of church right now. But when hell got hot enough and life got tough enough and storms got deep enough and trials got hard enough. You came looking for Jesus. I want 60 seconds of praise if I'm telling the truth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all your problems ain't over. Some of y'all still got some problems. Some of y'all still living a double life. Some of y'all still got some issues. But you have learned, come what may from day to day, I'm going to be in the house of the Lord. You're just going to have to work on me. You're going to have to fix me. You're going to have to put band-aids on me. You're going to have to give me chemo. You're going to have to do whatever you're going to have to do and treat me because I ain't never leaving you no more. I'm not leaving even you no more. I'm not going nowhere else. I'm not serving no other God. I'm not bowing to no other idol. I will have no other God before you. If I'm broke, I'm broken in you. If I'm torn, I'm torn in you. If I'm hurt, I'm hurt in you. If I'm talking to you, make some noise. I need some real noise.
look at somebody and tell them the devil made me do it. I've always said that whenever you see somebody who moves forward exceedingly, it is not always what they're going to that drove them, it's what they're running from. <laughs> Sometimes the hell you're running from will make you run to Jesus with a power and a passion that would blow your mind. And the exceptional people who do exceptional things, who are exceptional in school, exceptional in business, exceptional in life, stop being a hater. They're not there because they're greedy. They're there because they're needy. They're there because all hell broke loose. Some of them have been raped. Some of them have been battered. Some of them have been tattered. Some of them have been torn. And they had to run to Jesus. They had to be exceptional. They had to get up because they never dared be vulnerable ever again. And they're like, I want to talk to somebody. I want to talk to somebody. I want to talk to somebody. That you got up because you had to get up. You fought hard because you had to fight hard. You got that job because you had to have a job. You got tired of being hit up side your head. You got tired of being hit with skillets. You had to go back and get a degree so you could take care of yourself, your kids, your children. I want to talk to some people that were driven to Jesus, pulled to Jesus, yanked to Jesus, tugged to Jesus, told to Jesus. I want to talk to some people in this room that you didn't come because you was a nicey nice person. You came because you were desperate. You you knew a desperate for God. You needed a desperate miracle. You needed a desperate touch. You needed a desperate move of the Holy Ghost. And that's why you praise him like you praise him. Because you a desperate woman. And frankly, you don't care what none of these church people think. Because you got to praise him anyway. You don't care how they look at you. You don't care what they say about you. You don't care what you got on. Because you desperate. I I'm going to allow a moment for some desperate people to teach these nice people how to praise the Lord. Some desperate people who got problems right now. Some desperate people. Open up your mouth and give God some praise. Open up your mouth and shout unto God. Open up your mouth way up in the balcony. I want to hear you holler. Yes, make some noise. You saved and everything still ain't right at home. You still dealing with some stuff. It's not that her daughter was grievously vexed. She said, my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. You'd be shocked at what we shout over. You'd be shouted, shocked at what we dance over. You'd be shocked at what we're dealing with right now. You'd be shocked at how the enemy tries to destroy your house. I know you're standing there with your cute dress on and them big old shoes you can't walk in, but I want some people that got a devil in your house to open up your mouth and give God the praise. I want you to open your mouth and give God some praise. somebody say I want him out of my house type it on the line I want him out of my house I want him out for my children I want him out for my son I want him out for my daughter I want him out of my finances I want him out of my body I want him out of my spouse I got a devil in my house and that's why I'm in church right now that's why I'm desperate that's why I'm shouting that's why I'm hollering that's why I'm praying. That's why I'm fasting. Oh, stop being cute and let's be real this morning. I want some real people to open up your mouth and shout at the God.
Don't get me wrong, I'll pray about you. I'll pray for you. I'll pray for your marriage. I'll pray for your children. I really will. I'll intercede. I'll lay on my face and go before God. But it's one thing to pray for the devil in your house, and it's a whole other thing to pray for the devil in mine. I want him out of my house. I want him out of my body. I want him out of my children. I want him out of my finances. I want him out of my mind. It's one thing to have a devil on your job, and it's another thing to have a devil in your house. Get out of my house. Get out of my, get, 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 get. Get, 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 get out, get out, get out. Somebody take a minute and tell him, get out of my house. Get out of my, get out of my, get out of my house. Get out of my knee, get out of my joints, get out of my leg, get out of my lungs, get out of my tissue, get out of my children, get out, get out. Spirit of suicide, get out of my house. Mental illness, get out of my house. I don't want it in my children. I don't want it in my son. I don't want it in my daughter. Get out. Oh, you ain't desperate. Oh, you ain't desperate. If the praise stops when the music stops, you ain't desperate. But when you really get desperate, you don't need no organ to make you praise him. When you really get desperate, his praise shall continually be in your mouth. When you really get desperate, oh God, oh God, oh God. Give us some desperate people this morning. Give us some desperate people online. I want to preach to somebody who's sick and tired of the enemy working in your house. Make some noise and let me hear you. The problem is, and I'm almost finished, the problem is, When it's your child, who can you talk to when it's your spouse? Who can you talk to when it's your mama? Who can you talk to when it's about your daddy? So there you are wrestling between secrets and deliverance. I want deliverance, but it's a secret. I want deliverance, but it's a secret. And the woman decided the only one I can trust with what's going on in my house is Jesus. I'm not going out to the disciples. I'm going out to Jesus. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy. 
mercy on me. My daughter, my daughter, my daughter. My daughter, my daughter, my daughter. I feel like preaching now, y'all. My daughter, my daughter, my daughter. My flesh, my bone, my blood, my DNA, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. I'm sick of this. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> I put out libations and she didn't get better. I prayed to our deities and she didn't get better. I called on our idols and they didn't get better. And I know I'm not one of your favorites. And I know I don't belong to your church. And I know I'm not one of y'all. But I came all the way over here because the devil drove me over here to you. If anybody can do it, you can. I heard about your power. I heard what you did for the centurion. I heard what you did for the woman with the issue of blood. I heard what you did for Lazarus. My daughter needs a touch from God. And he I feel the Holy Ghost working on something. I feel the Holy Ghost working on something. I feel the Holy Ghost getting behind walls. I feel the Holy Ghost getting behind doors. I feel the Holy Ghost doing some surgery right now. I feel the Holy Ghost doing some operations right now. I feel the Holy Ghost dealing with marriages right now. I feel the Holy Ghost dealing with minds and emotions right now. I feel the Holy Ghost uncovering some secrets right now. I feel the Holy Ghost touching some areas where you've been traumatized and in pain and at your wit's end and don't know what to do. But God, I got news for you. God's going to get some victory out of what you're going through. I, can I tell you again? God's going to get some victory out of what you're going through. If I'm talking to you, praise him like it's already done. You may be online, but praise him like it's already done. Praise him like it's already done. I know he ain't said nothing. I know he ain't done nothing yet. But praise him like it's already done. Watch this. To all of her desperation. To all of her fury and frustration and stress and pain and turmoil and scream it out in him. He said Nothing. What do you do when you have articulated the problem clearly to the only one who can fix it? And he says nothing. Respectfully, I'm sick of preachers. <coughs> And I'm sick of the preaching we get half the time. Because y'all always preaching about when he answers. And I don't need you to tell me how to react when he answers. I ain't stupid. I know how to praise him when he answers. <laughs> I know how to dance when he answers. But what do you know? 
When you dial 911 and God don't say nothing, what do you do? When the enemy's breaking in your back door and the police don't answer the phone, what do you do when you call on Jesus and he acts deaf? He kept on walking. We don't sing about the silence of God. We sing about what he said and what he'll do and what he's promised. But we don't write no songs about the silence of God. I'm not struggling with his promises. I'm struggling with his silence. Don't you see me bleeding? <laughs> Don't you see me in pain? Do you know what it's like? to see your child suffer? I'd rather suffer myself. In the hospital on a respirator and your child can't breathe, unhook them and give it to me. At least I'm old enough to have experienced enough. And he ain't said, he ain't said nothing. What do you do when God says nothing? I'll tell you what she did. She drew closer. Sometimes God doesn't answer. To draw you closer. Sometimes he doesn't respond. to draw you closer. She draws closer to Jesus and says, Lord, help me. Help me. I'm through with titles, I'm through with honor, I'm through with protocol, protocol. I just want some help. Lord, Jesus in a dilemma. I never, I was driving home after praying for that guy. And I said, Lord, that ain't supposed to happen like that. The Lord is not supposed to follow me and give me a word of knowledge for somebody from a whole different religion. And the glory moved. And I, I was confused. She put Jesus in a, in a dilemma. He says, almost as if he wasn't even talking to her. It's, it's not right what you're asking me to do. It's not, 
It's not protocol. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not the way I planned it. It's not the way it's supposed to happen. It's, it's not supposed to be like that. It's not, it's not appropriate. It's not my assignment now. That's not what he told me to do. He told me to come to my own. And I'm not through dealing with my own. You dealing with your daughter and I'm dealing with my children. Your daughter is grievously vexed with the devil and my children are vexed with unbelief. Oh, y'all didn't hear what I said. Both of us got child problems. And how am I supposed to deal with your child and I can't hardly fix my own? It's not meat. It's not meat. It's not meat to give the children's bread to the dogs. I'm still trying to get them to eat the bread. I'm trying to get my child to eat the bread. And you telling me about your child? My child in trouble too. For we have not a high priest who cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmity, tempted in all points, like as we are. You got a troubled child? He said, I do too. It's not me to give the children's bread to the dogs. And the woman blew his mind. She said, yeah, I'm a dog. I'm a dog. In the Bible, a dog meant without covenant. I'm a Gentile. I'm an idolater. I'm a dog. But even the dogs. Even the dogs can eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She says, I will settle for what your church wastes. Your children waste enough glory to heal my door. Listen at them at the bargaining table. It's like the woman and Jesus are at the bargaining table at a good conference table where they're, they're, they're arguing their positions. And, 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 and she says, you know, my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. He says, I can't do nothing. My children are crazy too. I'm trying to deal with my own children. It's not me to give the children bread to the dogs. She said, yeah, I may be a dog, but even the dogs can eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And with that, she broke him. Her humility broke him. Her inability to be insulted broke him. Sometimes you can't get your miracle because you're too proud. I'm talking to somebody. I don't know who I'm talking to, but God has you online for a reason. Your pride is killing you. That woman didn't argue with Jesus about calling her dog. She said, truth. I'm a hoe. True, I done done some mess, Lord. True, I have not been the picture of morality and integrity and honor. But I'm desperate. I'd be a dog, but can I have a crow? Her 
indictment is as much against our waste as it is his power. She says we waste sermons that would save the world. Messages that would stop guns from going off. We waste them. She said, I could get healed from the crumbs. I could get healed from what your children don't even pay attention to. Leave the bread on the table for you kids. I'll sit in your lap and catch the crumbs. In the days of Jesus, they had what was called, in the days of Jesus, they had what was called lap dogs. And they would sit in the lap of the master and look up and catch the crumbs. She says, I'll be your lap dog. If I can get a crumb of what falls from the master's table. My daughter will be healed. And the disciples said, sit away. She cried out to us. It was never about them. Because she knew that what she needed, only God could do. And the Lord told me if I would preach this, he would minister to, to some people who were going through something that only God can fix. And the Lord said, he's seen your desperate faith, your radical tenacity, your relentless pursuit of him, and your refusal to let anybody run you out of church. Your refusal. You came, if you had to get a ride, you came. You came, you came when you had money, you came when you didn't have money. You, if you had to wear a mask, if you had to take a shot, if you had to get a test, whatever it took, because you're too desperate to be cute. <laughs> and God said, I've not, I've not found it a wolf shot. I've not found this kind of faith amongst my own. Her faith, not her feelings, not her emotions, not her attitude, not her beauty, not her intellect, not her sensuality. Her faith. He said, I cannot deny you because you have so much confidence that I am able to do it. Woman, you have desperate faith. And I don't know who I'm preaching to today but to get out of what you're into, it's going to take desperate faith. And that self-same hour, <laughs> that self-same hour, not later, not when she got back home, not when she took an anointed rag and put it in her bed, that self same hour. Her daughter was made whole. I want some folks to stand who ain't even asking for you. You're asking for somebody else. <laughs> 